So said the Duke of Wellington, the man who finally defeated Napoleon at Waterloo. War is a horrible business. And yet, in the midst of carnage and destruction, we can see heroism. Endurance and willpower that goes beyond. They lived by the sword and they died by the sword. They followed the warrior's way. The Vikings were ferocious seagoing warriors, pirates, and traders who raided and settled across a broad swath of the globe from the 8th until the 11th century. The original Vikings hailed from Denmark, Sweden, and Norway. They were skilled navigators and traders and knew the coasts of Europe like the veins of an arm. When we think of Vikings, we think of Viking raiding parties. And when it comes to Viking raids, it was the attack on Lindisfarne Monastery off the coast of Northumberland in 793 AD that sealed the Vikings' brutal reputation. This part is the first successful Viking activity. We do know from the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, which is an account the monks keep in, in various places in England in the pre-modern world. Lindisfarne was a, an important and wealthy monastery. From a Viking perspective, it was surely plunder with uh, low risk and uh, the possibility of a uh, rich raid. Suddenly they run in a whole bunch of men who have no rationale to fighting, no weapons to fight with, and Tons and tons and tons of really pretty stuff. Things that the Vikings know they can sell elsewhere, including even the gold that the pages are made of in these, in the, these Bibles and, and other books that the Lindisfarne monks have. It'd be like a, finding a treasure chest that was completely unguarded. After the Lindisfarne Abbey raid, the Viking attacks increased phenomenally into the North Sea, across to England, over to Ireland, over to France and to Germany. Alcuin, a Northumbrian scholar serving in Charlemagne's court in Aachen, wrote of Lindisfarne, the heathens poured out the blood of saints around the altar and trampled on the bodies of saints in the temple of God, like dung in the street. Never before has such an atrocity been seen. The raid sent shockwaves through Anglo-Saxon England and the Christian West, with good reason. The raid on the monastery was just the beginning. Viking raids would terrorize England for the next 200 years. The Vikings were known all over Europe for their long ships, by means of which they could just pop in in the right moment and at the right place, crossing seas and rivers. They were odd individuals no matter what, the ones who decided, geez, you know, farming isn't for me. 
So let's go on and see what else I can do that might be profitable. They were surely very fierce and savage. Although, I mean, in the last decades, there has been a debate among scholars, because some of them suggested that as we rely on sources that were written by uh, the people who actually were attacked by Vikings, maybe the sources are in a way exaggerating the ferocity of the Vikings. From uh, one point of view, we can say that the alleged savagery of the attacks uh, of the Viking uh, can also be referred to the type of uh, information, the type of uh, historical uh, information and chronicles that we have, which all come from uh, the ends of the monks, of the Christian uh, culture, the Christian world. Uh, so they used to depict uh, the Vikings uh, in a specific uh, way, in a, in a terrible way, we can say. But on the other end, we can also say that uh, these Vikings uh, were as uh, brutal and savage uh, as all the other warriors uh, in the medieval era. The Viking chieftains would decide on the target and plan their raid in advance. They would strike under cover of darkness with lightning speed and a savagery unprecedented even for medieval times. Growing up in a small village close to the Danish sea, young Viking Sigurd Bjornsson gains his sea legs while still young. From his elders, he learns how important Viking longboats were in their lightning raids. Arriving seemingly out of nowhere in the fastest ships of the day, they would storm ashore ready to attack. When required, they could also row their ships upriver and tie them off. Vikings did not like attacking large groups of people. They were never very many themselves. Maybe a ship full, maybe two ships. Perhaps at times they could get even more. But usually it's just one ship and it's raiding an area. The Vikings developed navigation skills that were pretty much advanced. Uh, we can see these uh, when we analyze uh, the several battles that they managed to win on the sea, although they also managed to lose uh, many of them. We can also see these at the center of their expeditions, of their journeys through the seas and through the ocean. So Eric the Red, for example, is famous for having transversed the ocean, reaching the American continent and what is nowadays Canada. Sigurd watches many times as his father returns home from raids laden with booty. It fills him with desire to go raiding himself. But why did the Vikings come screaming out of their Scandinavian homelands in the late 8th century AD? This is still a hotly disputed question. The young Viking Sigurd Bjornsson is a second son, destined to be a warrior, a born fighter. Sigurd's journey begins in 10th century Denmark, around a century after the looting of Lindisfarne Monastery, the height of the Viking's marauding and raping of Europe. He has quite a reputation to live up to, if he wishes to be considered a Viking in the warrior's way. But why did the Vikings begin to venture beyond their borders into neighboring and, in some cases, faraway countries? Historians point to a rising population, more mouths to feed, combined with poor harvests. At the same time, the Viking skill as shipbuilders and as navigators had grown in leaps and bounds. Yeah. 
all reasonable explanations. However, it's just as likely that it was simple opportunism that some of the more adventurous warriors raided their neighbors, and when they returned home laden with booty, the idea began to catch on. Although there was a lot more to Vikings than their raids on villages, monasteries, and convents, it was for these assaults using shock tactics that we will always remember them. These were warriors who were taught to fight from boyhood. Sigurd Bjornsson was no exception to this rule. These may look like children's games, but it wasn't long before wooden swords would be replaced with real ones. Probably they started to learn how to fight quite early when they were very young. For example, we know that leaders like Knut the Great took part in campaigns when they were not even 20 years old. Or another world leader like Harold Adrada was wounded in a battle when he was just 15. Young warriors like Sigurd Bjornsson were not only expected to become marksmen, they were supposed to be able to throw their javelins high over the ranks of their enemies. Every young Viking lad would need to master archery. The bow and arrow was used for hunting, and archery tournaments were common. The Viking sagas have many archery contests. The full range of Viking weapons consisted of javelins, bow and arrows, axes, as well as seeks, and swords, the preferred weapons of the nobility. For Vikings, as much if not more than medieval knights, swords in particular had an almost mythical dimension. Viking swords are beautiful. Each one is a work of art. You can see the beauty and the simplicity of their proportions and decor. They're an invaluable legacy left to us by our Viking ancestors, depicting a rich history of art and the behavior of mankind. We have to imagine our Viking warrior with a shield, defending himself with a shield that was made of parallel wooden boards. It could have been colored, in bright colors even, with an iron boss in the middle. A weapon used by both walking warriors and cavalry fighters was the lance. It was relatively cheap and easy to manufacture. As a result, they were produced in great numbers, making it a very popular weapon. Scholars believe almost every fighter carried one. Ancient authors say the lance was a typical weapon of every Germanic warrior. The lance, also referred to as the spear, was so important it was spoken of in runic writings. Some spears were embedded with magical inscriptions. Another important weapon was the sea ox, though it wasn't a compulsory piece of equipment. Think of the sea ox as a big knife. Its length could vary depending on who made it. It was different from an ordinary knife in that it was designed to be a massive cutting weapon. It had to have some weight in order to withstand being struck without the blade being damaged. And then they would use axes that we tend to consider the Viking weapon par excellence. But actually, when we found axes in the graves to make a distinction between a tool and a weapon, so we don't know much about their use. The most complicated and expensive weapon to produce was the sword. As only members of the upper social group could obtain one, it was not part of a warrior's standard equipment. We don't know if swords were made exclusively in Scandinavia or if they were imported. They were probably made in more than one place, but we believe the blades were almost certainly imported into Scandinavia. During the Viking era, the mere possession of a sword meant that the owner was significant and not just an ordinary fighter. The sword could be actually decorated as well as the scabbard where the sword was kept.
Some of the souls in the Icelandic sagas even have names. This suggests that they were considered really important by Viking warriors. So we know the Vikings had an impressive array of assault weapons, but what about defense? Not all warriors could afford a helmet or armor, but they all carried a shield into battle. Many Viking warrior remains have wounds to the head and legs where the shield could not protect them. Shields could also be used as makeshift stretchers to carry wounded, and shields could even be used as weapons, something that Sigurd particularly appreciates. Vikings wore armor. They wore male armor, uh, so rings, sometimes we call them, ring down like chain mail, they are male. But they were protective, extremely protective to the body and to the torso. Mind the Vikings did not like having their arms bound at all by the armor, and so often they, their arms were free from armor. They would wear furs and they would wear leathers and other things that would protect them there. But the chief protection for all the Vikings were to, one, their helmet, and second, their shield. And that, if you think about it, could cover everything pretty much from the top of their head down to their knees. And that's the most important part of any warrior's body that needs to be protected. If you've got a wound in the, in the, the arm or a wound in the leg, you can pretty well survive it. But if you've got a wound to the torso, especially if it affects the, the uh, organs, or if you have a wound at all to the head, you're not going to make it. So the shield was particularly made, that was uh, usually just wood, but it was made with lots of metal bits, and it was really thick, and it was um, pretty heavy. And the Vikings would use this in conjunction with others. If they did need to fight together with another person, in conjunction with others, where they could overlap those shields and actually make a, a, a field fortification, what we call a shield wall, and uh, that would protect them on a battlefield about as, as well as anything. In battle, the first line of attack and defense was the shield formation. In a shield wall, a Viking's left arm would always carry his shield and right arm, his weapon. Otherwise, the shields would not have been able to overlap. Of course, the image of the Viking handed down over the last century or two also includes Vikings wearing those famous horned helmets. Actually, the idea that the Viking warriors were wearing horned helmets comes from the 19th century. It's a romanticized way of looking back to these uh, savage warriors, and you find some description uh, pointing to this uh, direction uh, also in uh, some of Wagner's operas. We can say that it would be really uh, unpractical for a soldier, for a warrior, to wear a horned helmet, because this would expose uh, the warrior himself uh, to all the various items and weapons and objects that would be thrown uh, against him. Viking warfare was a lot less romantic than a Wagnerian opera. But the Vikings, too, loved a good story, especially if accompanied by strong drink. Typical for Viking lads, Sigurd Bjornsson would have started drinking not long after he first picked up a weapon. This was the place to be, the Mead Hall of a liege lord, where the festivities could go on for days. Here Sigurd hears all the epic tales of Viking warriors who came before him, whetting his appetite for what lies ahead. In the middle there would be fire burning, and uh, the chieftain that was hosting these festivities would have um, a special chair probably, 
and uh, the most important guests will sit close to him. People were richly dressed and scolds, so the poets, who had proclaimed their mm, poems, telling the stories of gods and heroes of the ancient past. Drinking was important, it really had um, very social importance. There were even ritual drinks, so Vikings would drink uh, ale or mead from drinking horns. They were important also because during these ritual drinks, uh, ritual toasts actually, oaths were uh, sworn, speeches were given, uh, even uh, marriages were arranged or even alliances. Sigurd dreams that his own exploits will one day be a saga to be told. At the same time, he knows he doesn't want to join the Viking equivalent of the special forces, the so-called berserkers. Sigurd isn't quite that hardcore, however much courage the mead gives him. Berserkers were half men, half beast. When they attacked, they howled like mad dogs or wolves. They usually fought bare-chested, if not naked, or clothed in animal skins. In the midst of battle, they seemed to feel no fear, nor even pain. In peak berserker mode, they would kill indiscriminately, even men from their own side. Berserkers are a warrior legend that will live on forever, but we have proof they existed. In Viking culture, women were also expected to fight. Shield maidens were mythological female warriors, remarkably tough and fierce. We know Viking women, unlike many of their contemporaries, could own property and divorce their husbands. But did they really fight alongside their menfolk? Shield maidens feature heavily in Norse sagas and also crop up in the artwork of the time. But myth or reality, the jury is still out. What usually happens is that the sex of a person who is buried is judged either by the human remains or by the goods that were buried with this person. So most of the times, if they found a person with, buried uh, with weapons, they would assume it was a man. But recently, some scholars demonstrated that, apparently, one uh, of the skeletons that was buried in Birka in uh, Sweden and was buried with weapons was considered a man but actually was a woman. So uh, re-examining the human remains of this burial, they came to the conclusion that it was actually a woman. And so they wanted to demonstrate that uh, Viking uh, women warriors actually existed, as it is told in the literature and in Paris legends. Since he's old enough to drink in the mead hall, Sigurd is now ready to join a raiding party, setting out to sea in a longboat. These were sinister yet beautiful looking vessels. In their day, the prow of a Viking longboat must have been as terrifying as the sight of a German U-boat periscope during World War II, more so because when the Vikings dealt out devastation, it was up close and personal. The chief bottom line of anything is the Vikings were probably the best shipbuilders that ever occupied the world. They knew how to build ships and they knew how to keep the ships dry. They knew how to keep the ships light. They knew how to keep the ships flexible. They could lengthen them, but they knew also if they lengthened them, they had to make them thinner. If they widen them for cargo reasons, they had to make them shorter. Well, they could even be 30 or 35 meters long. Uh, for example, judging from some Viking ships that were found in Roskilde in Denmark. The crew will be of 50 or even more men. They were long. They also have a, a very shallow draft. So that means that they were very maneuverable. 
but they were not very stable in high sea. When they needed long ships, like the case of, of one in Roskilde, for example, it was long. It was quite long, quite narrow, held about 60 oars on each side, so about 120 oars total. And each oar could have one or more Vikings, so maybe about 250 Vikings in the vessel, counting those who would be the leaders and other things. With as many as 250 warriors on board, it's remarkable just how swiftly the Viking longboats could plow through the waters. Five or six knots, that means 10 kilometers per hour, and even an average speed of seven knots when it was propelled by sail, with peaks of even 10 knots. Back in Denmark, Sigurd Bjornsson has established himself as a key member of a raiding party. He has returned from each raid with booty and is now resplendent in new armor and the finest weapons. And from the looks of things, perhaps this wild young man could settle down with a nice Viking girl. But we wouldn't bet on it. Sigurd now not only dreams of glory, but of making himself rich. What is it good for? Well, for one thing, loot. In some ways, the Vikings were as much gangsters as they were warriors. In the 10th century, they set up the world's first ever protection racket. It was known as Danegeld and sometimes Herregeld. These were taxis levied by the Danes in Anglo-Saxon England, and in return for paying them, local chiefs could be fairly sure their township would not be targeted in the next Viking raid. Danegeld sometimes misunderstood. It really was flexible. The Danegeld could be paid as a ransom to Vikings to stay away. It's like protection money to stay away from the towns. There could be a Danegeld paid by other Vikings to other Vikings. Uh, it could be a tax by Viking protectors of local peoples. Uh, that seems to be what it eventually comes to be, is Vikings who are settled but are now going to protect the locals with their skills, their military skills. Flexible it might have been, but not to pay it was to invite retribution without mercy. We know at least one famous example of, not strictly speaking, a Danegeld, but a tribute that was not paid to the Vikings. And this story happened in uh, 1012, when the Vikings arrived in uh, Canterbury. They sieged the city and then they asked for a tribute to be paid. And the population actually paid this tribute. But they, I mean, the, the archbishop was their prisoner. The, the Viking took him as a prisoner and they asked for a, a faster money, uh, for another sum to free the archbishop. And apparently the Archbishop didn't want the people to pay even more to free him. So eventually, during a Viking feast, when the Vikings were drunk, they killed him. These kinds of episodes ensured that payments were invariably delivered in full and on time. And with each Danegeld payment, the Vikings gained in strength and kept returning with higher demands. Put it this way. The Dane Guild in the year 990 AD was 11,500 ounces of silver. 22 years later, it had increased over 5,000% to 650,000 ounces of silver. From raiders, Vikings had evolved into loan sharks and protection rackets, giving them a permanent foothold in communities.
Sigurd certainly has no qualms about taking the Dane Geld, nor for that matter enforcing penalties on those who don't pay. In fact, he enjoys his work. But while the Vikings may have been pirates, looters, and loan sharks, they were also explorers. They were the first Europeans to reach North America, where they actually settled down in a few places. After the periods of their rides, once they settled on the territories uh, that they could visit, uh, like on the Orkney or Shetland Islands, uh, on the Ferrer, on uh, Iceland itself, so they for sure became uh, agricultural people. They became uh, people uh, who could grow their crops, uh, who could take care of their cattle, uh, who could live uh, a peaceful life, especially once they became uh, Christian. So after the coming, after the arrival of Christianity, uh, they settled down, uh, they uh, put together their own uh, local communities, and so if not hippies, they managed to survive uh, in a less uh, military way, we can say. Pretty soon, certainly by the end of the 10th century, half of Northern England is Anglo-Scandinavian. They now have so many Viking settlers. There's some idea that the, the ginger hair color in an Irishman comes from the Danes because so many Danes had settled in Ireland, including founding the city of Dublin. So the Vikings, unlike many, many other raiding peoples, they did tend to spread out. The Rus were Vikings. So Russia, the Rus land, was Vikings. The Varangians, down in Byzantium and Bulgaria and other places along the rivers of the Dnieper and Volga River. Those two were Vikings. So the Viking Scandinavians spread quite considerably. This is Lons O Meadows, a Viking settlement in Canada's Newfoundland territory. It's over 1,000 years old. The site of Lanzo Meadow suggests that it was used as a base for further exploration, uh, looking for resources. Uh, for example, some butternuts were found there, and we know that they grow only 800 kilometers south than Lanzo Meadow. That means that they will actually stop there and then travel again to reach other places. Vikings run amok seems from about 780 until about 1060. And we're not entirely certain why they stop. I mean, that's two centuries of pretty good running amok. Well, is it that the treasures became fewer? Is it that the, the more settlements began to take place? Is it the fact that you know, places like Normandy established very strong governments? Uh, is it Christianity that flows into these areas? Almost everybody is Christianized by the middle of the 11th century. All of those are possible. A 2018 DNA map revealed the full extent of Viking bloodline spread over Britain and Ireland. The city of Dublin is known as a Viking city. Who knows, there may even be more Viking warrior in you than you think. There's no doubt that Viking genetics will fill Europe, especially Northern Europe, with new Viking genetics. The English language is developed um, using Viking words frequently. So too is the cuisine. We probably wouldn't know salmon as a food without good Vikings that use it as a frequent uh, means of changing their diet from hunting and, and uh, gathering. Although, thanks to the sagas, the westward Viking raids are relatively well known, their routes to the east were less well publicized. On a great night in the Mead Hall, Sigurd's warrior tribe pay host to a visitor from the east, a trader with trinkets from as far away as Constantinople. Sigurd can barely take his eyes off this exotic stranger. His clothes and manners seem different, but he too is a type of Viking a Varangian to be precise, or an Eastern Viking. The Varangians were 9th and 10th century Vikings who went eastward and southward through what is now Russia, Belarus, and the Ukraine. 
The difference between the Western Vikings and the Eastern Vikings is uh, uh, basically this, uh, that the Western Vikings, those uh, centered on Denmark, uh, uh, on Norway, will uh, colonize the Western part uh, of uh, the world known at the time, while the Varangians, uh, mainly coming from Sweden, uh, will colonize the eastern part of Europe, uh, the Russian side of Europe, and they will uh, receive the name of uh, Rus uh, by the people uh, living there in the region of uh, Novgorod. The Varangians succeeded in uh, building uh, their uh, first uh, Viking state. Sigurd is drawn to the merchant and his tales of the Varangians. These Eastern Vikings who ruled over the medieval state of Kievan Rus, modern-day Ukraine, but roamed as far as the Mediterranean. In Constantinople, modern-day Istanbul, they formed the Byzantine Varangian Guard, serving the Eastern Roman Empire. The Varangian Guard that was formed in Byzantium was a group of individuals from the north. Now, they didn't all have to be Scandinavians. We know that Anglo-Saxons and French actually participated as well. It was a group that were mercenaries that had gone pretty much for reasons that we're told in some of the sagas the reasons could be as much as a, a crime, treason, something along these lines, and then you end and they flee and get away and go for employment, and that's where they can get good employment. They were very, very strong elite warriors within the Byzantine army, and the Byzantines counted on quite a bit. So probably the Varangian guard received the weapons from, uh, I mean, the weapons were provided from the Eastern Empire, so they would receive helmets, probably with the chain mail uh, protecting the neck, and then they would have uh, also scale armors, so that was possibly different from what they would use in Scandinavia, and uh, Probably the most important difference was the, the shield. There was not a round shield anymore, but was a, a kite shield. Bigger and longer shield that would protect a, a bigger portion of the body. Sigurd was captivated by stories of the Varangian Guard, that elite band of Viking warriors who protect the Eastern Roman Empire. He dreams of going to Constantinople himself one day, but he may be on his way sooner than he thinks. A little too much flirtation with another warrior's intended bride results in a face full of need for Sigurd Bjornsson. It's a challenge to his manhood that Sigurd dared not refuse. There is a traditional way for these kind of disputes to be settled, and it isn't by flipping a coin. The home gang or Viking trials by combat were the accepted way of settling disputes. Whichever man won, well, his was the more just cause, for the gods had so willed it. And it was practical too, because as the home gang was frequently a trial to the death, the loser wouldn't be around to complain. On 
Tongang uh, literally means to go to an island. The source that lists the rules of the Homsgang in a more detailed way is Karma's saga. We know that uh, a cloak was laid on the ground. They will uh, actually measure three squares or one foot each around this cloak and then put some uh, hazel poles uh, at the corners. So that field was then called Hazel Field. They will also make sacrifices before the duel and say some prayers. And then they will start fighting. Every fighter had the right to have three shields and uh, a companion of him would hold the shield during the fight, so actually contributing in a very active way uh, to the duel. And when all the shields were destroyed, the, the fighters had to enter to go on to the cloak and then fight with their weapons. So the one who was challenged had the right to strike the first uh, blow. When uh, someone was wounded, the duel could actually stop or they could decide to go on. And they were not supposed to step outside the area, the cloak. In the end, Sigurd emerges the winner. But soon after, the consequences of his victory begin to sink in, as the family of his victim are influential in the Viking hierarchy and put pressure on Sigurd to leave. Perhaps it is time he too considered going east. The Viking world in the 10th century covers a lot of territory. Viking warriors really spread their wings. In their famed longboats, the Norsemen, literally men from the north, invaded England twice. They roamed as far as the Volga River in modern-day Ukraine and Russia. But then, by the mid-11th century, the Viking Age came to an abrupt end. But why? The main reasons for which the Viking Age uh, came to an end is really related uh, to the developments uh, going on in Europe and in the Western world uh, around the 10th and the 11th century. At a certain point, the Vikings decided to settle down, to constitute uh, and to create their own uh, states. This happened uh, in what is nowadays uh, Normandy, which actually is the northern region of France, uh, receiving its name uh, by the Norsemen, uh, Vikings, uh, who settled down there around the 10th century. So they became uh, sort of allies uh, to Charles the Simple, uh, the king uh, of uh, the Franks, uh, and they decided to settle down there uh, under their own uh, ruler, uh, Rollo. Who knows how long the Vikings themselves expected to last, or if they even thought about such things. Most Viking warriors did not live until old age. The Vikings believed that in the afterlife, the bravest warriors went to Valhalla, where they would spend their days battling each other. The knights would be given over to drinking, feasting, wine, women, and song. They'd all get up the next day and do it all over again. The whole point of life for the Vikings was to test oneself against adversity and then celebrate one's victories. But if the battle went against them, they would fight to the last man and embrace an honorable death to live again in the afterlife. That was the Viking way. By Odin's eye, that was the warrior's way. Vikings are an elite force, an elite military force, in, in perhaps not in the way that they fought, perhaps not in the technology and tactics or their leadership. But they had, were an elite force in the, what they believed in the honor of fighting. As a warrior, probably they can teach other warriors of other ages is the, the importance of surprise, of the courage of risk for more, seek for more. It's a civilization rather than just simply warriors. Possibly the skill to adapt to different situations and also to merge with other populations.
And what of Sigurd? Having won his trial by combat, he is now having to face the consequences. If he stays where he is, Sigurd will always be looking over his shoulder, pretty sure that one day, someone will avenge his victim's death. And so, remembering the tales of the East that had always enthralled him, Sigurd decides to make his way to Constantinople. His hope is to join the Varangian Guard, the Eastern Roman Emperor's own personal escort in Constantinople. Istanbul, once Constantinople. Looking at the city today with its Islamic landmarks, it seems an unlikely place for Vikings to have inhabited. We leave Sigurd as he arrives in Constantinople, hoping to join the Varangian Guard. He is at the crossroads, a little older and wiser, but still convinced that death in battle is the only way to live.